going to give uh, a very brief introduction to arthroplasticity for those who do not treat much of it. So I think it's a, still a fairly rare, thankfully, uh, uh, disease. So uh, what is arthroplasticity? Uh, I get a lot of this question. It's really just a descriptive diagnosis. It just means that you have joint contractures in two or more limbs. And I, I would say that, that definition is probably uh, in debate uh, as well. Uh, they may have nervous or muscular system abnormalities. There's amyoplasia, which is the most common form. About a third of cases are amyoplasia. Idiopathic, uncommon association with hypodactyly or symbrachydactyly, depending on how you look at it. Uh, it's unlikely now due to restricted urinary motion. It used to be thought that that was, a, that was a cause, but there's been several papers that have come out saying that uh, the, the former things of oligohydramnios, twin birth, and bicornate uterus are probably not contributors. Uh, what do they look like? They have absent joint creases often, waxy skin, storkbite hemangiomas are very common. Um, I always amaze uh, parents when I say, so they have a little hemangioma here? Oh my god, yeah. How about one back here? Yeah, how did you know that? Um, cute button noses, uh, variable extremity involvement. Most kids have all four limbs involved. Uh, Mary Beth has published a paper on asymmetric involvement of the upper extremities and the need for imaging from that. Uh, but overall, it tends to affect both limbs of the upper limbs and um, lower limbs, and often, most often all, all limbs. There's distal arthrogryposis, which are the uh, mostly autosomal dominant. There's some autosomal recessive disorders, and this list, list keeps growing. Uh, this is from an old paper uh, now. It's probably 10 years old. Um, but the list is, I think, now up to 14. It's variable penetrance, <coughs> and it tends to spare the central joints, hence the name distal arthrogryposis. Some common types are Freeman Sheldon syndrome, or sorry, more iconic types, or whistling face, which you can see. Beal syndrome, which looks like uh, Marfan's, contractual arachnodactyly is another name for it. And they basically have, uh, they look exactly like Marfan's uh, phenotypically, except for these uh, camptodactyls in the fingers and uh, these crumpled little ears. Um, multiple, multiple pterygium syndrome, like Escobar, autosomal recessive. You have about 300 other types. So this is a kind of a wastebasket diagnosis. Emery Dreyfus, muscular dystrophy, CNS disorders, X-linked, uh, infantile spinal muscular atrophy, etc. So uh, global issues, and I apologize, the video is not playing. I didn't really check to see what would work. Uh, but it's not that important. Ambulation, self-feeding, perineal care, self-care. And I, I learned this, I attribute this to Mary Beth, and I don't know if this is really true, but one hand to eat and one hand to wipe and it may be the same hand. So we're really careful about bilateral procedures in these children, just to make sure that they have, um, ideally, some overlap with the hands, but also, if necessary, some divergence. Both of those are important, I think, is one hand to eat, one hand to wipe. Uh, initial treatment stretching, 80% of kids with amyoplasia get therapy into their teenage years. Uh, splinting, we try to discourage daytime splinting, unless it's a functional improvement. Uh, but uh, restrict our splinting mostly to nighttime to encourage use. And then serial casting, we found overall is better for distal arthrogryposis than for amyoplasia. So just going down the list of, from the shoulder down, which is how I look at my examination, uh, shoulder <coughs> contractures, we really don't have any options to increase the strength of motion at this time in the shoulder. What, the only thing we can really fix is rotational deformity. So external rotation humeral osteotomy, I think, has become a mainstay in many of our practices. And you see this crossover grass pattern uh, grabbing Mr. Potato Head, and uh, there's the osteotomy to improve that. Uh, elbow contractures, the again, I think fairly accepted now, elbow extension contractures are treated with ulnar nerve transposition, posterior capsule release, and triceps lengthening. And then you have elbow flexion contractures, which are, I think, a much more difficult problem to solve. We've sort of gone around that, and we're doing distal humeral uh, closing wedge osteotomies to try to improve the position of the elbow, just to reorient the arc, but we're not doing anything about increasing the arc. But I, I, I think that's a, that would be a good debate. Then we have uh, tendon transfers for active elbow flexion, um, and everything listed there, and we're going to talk about a lot of these things in the symposium. Uh, forearm contractures. I think contrary to what's commonly written, most patients I find are in neutral position. Pronation and supination contractures I find are also equally about as common. Pronation is required for through the legs wiping, and it's helpful for iPad and keyboarding. Supination is required for behind the back wiping, and it's also helpful for eating, especially if they don't have adequate elbow flexion and require supination and wrist flexion to reach their mouth. 
And then you have wrist contractures, which are most commonly in flexion, although there are some, particularly with distal arthropus, that have extension contractures of the wrist. They'll have fibrotic or shortened forearm muscles, particularly with amyoplasia, absent wrist extensors or flexors, depending on the, orient, uh, on the direction of their contracture, and uh, often carpal coalitions as well. Um, wrist extension tends to improve appearance, improve grasp, but it may weaken finger extension, which limits your uh, capture and uh, release, which wrist flexion improves. Then you may also require wrist flexion for wiping, especially if you're through the legs. It may be required for eating if you don't have adequate elbow flexion, as I just mentioned, and it may be required for scooting. A lot of kids weight bear on the dorsum of the wrist, and taking that away is a big problem in terms of the mobility. So treatment options, splinting, passive range of motion, serial casting, um, ECU to ECRV transfers will commonly do for um, passively correctable flexion deformities, and then the carpal wedge osteotomy, uh, which a lot of people in this room have written about, and I think that's become the mainstay of treatment today. Thumb and palm, I think is, uh, there's not one diagnosis of thumb and palm, there are many thumb types, and, and all of these things I think have to be taken into consideration, type versus web space, MP flexion contractures, CMC flexion contractures, which are not the same thing, passively correctable versus static deformities, rotational deformities, they tend to be in supination very commonly of the thumb, so almost in the plane of the fingers. There's FPL deficient and even FPB deficient uh, thumbs. And then there's thumbs that get in the way of mobile fingers, as well as thumbs that are too far from stiff fingers. Then you have camptodactyly, uh, very commonly in these children. And I think that's, uh, that's a very difficult problem to treat, and our success rates are decreased. Certainly not without a fight. Um, there is some, uh, in the literature you'll find that there's a division between extensor insufficiency as a primary cause, in which case the general recommendations are release tight molar structures and augment the extensors, and then flexor tightness primary, where just releasing the molar structure is, is recommended. So my two cents here, um, these children really have a thin margin for error, and I think you need to treat the, the entire patient. So things that you do for shoulder external rotation may impact how they use their hand, terminally obviously, and so you have to consider what's going on with the wrist, what's going on with the forearm, what's going on with the fingers, what's going on with the thumb when you're just doing a humor rotation osteotomy. Beware of bilateral procedures. I think that um, there are very few things, <coughs> the only thing I think we do bilaterally really is, uh, is humor rotation osteotomies. Just because that tends, that tends to be a fairly predictable operation. Elbow releases, carpal wedges, um, thumbs we've done bilaterals as well, uh, tend to be less predictable. Uh, beware of too much at once. Trust and educate uh, your, uh, your therapist. We rely on our therapists a lot. The two therapists in this room, plus the others that we have, um, have really taught us a lot, and, and I think it's, it's a nice two-way street. And we've also learned a lot from our patients and uh, our parents. Um, so uh, pay attention, and I think that uh, this is a very difficult uh, patient population to treat, but also very rewarding. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dan.